right, my name is Billy Carando. Uh, you can find me at Billy Carando and at William.Carando um, at IBM. So if you have any questions uh, that you don't get a chance to ask during this presentation or here, uh, feel free to DM me or send me an email. I will be more than happy to answer any questions you have. So of course this presentation is collaborative contract-driven development. So how many people here are actually already doing contract-driven development right now as an organization? A couple. A few. Yeah. Of course, you know, that's kind of why you're here to learn about it. So that makes sense. Uh, so let's get started. Um, one quick thing is um, IBM Cloud is a great place if you're uh, needed to run your spring workloads. We have options, you know, if you're running Spring Boot, of course, Apache Tomcat. And if you're um, still running in the um, WebSphere or more uh, enterprise kind of um, war setting, we also have Open Liberty. So you can uh, check it out here. Also, feel free to ask me any questions about IBM Cloud. But what you really hear about is contract-driven development. So let's just briefly kind of cover at a very high level what contract-driven development is, and we'll get into it in more depth later, just to kind of get your maybe head around this space. Um, so the point of contract-driven development is to define the behavior of an API. So a client is going to send a call to a service and that call is going to be like obviously a request and it's going to go to some sort of endpoint and it's going to have like a body perhaps if it's you know a post or something like that it may not if it's like git also many things have like headers but based upon that kind of request then the service assuming you know should respond in a certain way you know it's going to maybe be a 200 response and it's going to have some amount of headers and information within that Contract driven development is when you actually write this down in some sort of contract that can be actually programmed and tested against. You're not just kind of like writing down in paper saying, oh, yeah, this is what this endpoint is going to look like, and then this is what it's going to look like within the body, um, and you just kind of have to take everybody's word at it. You're actually going to have something you can test against. So that way, if there's like something like a small disagreement, like, oh, we did like a hyphen instead of an underscore for maybe like first name um, between the first and name in it. Uh, you actually have something programmable that will actually test to validate to make sure it's actually matching what you agreed to. So why should you care about this? So obviously since many people, only a few people here are actually doing contract driven development, obviously people are actually pushing and deploying code to production right now without it. So why do you need to change? Why should you care about changing? Obviously, I guess to some extent you're interested in changing. Um, but one way I've always found about pushing changes or kind of getting organizations to change is you have to kind of explain what is the current problem with the way we're doing things right now? How can it be approved upon? And I kind of think about this scene from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. One of the characters, Charlie, is seen taking a bag of trash through the bar. And a couple other characters, Mac and Dennis, stop him and ask him what he's going to do with it. And he says he's going to burn the trash. And they're like, no, you shouldn't do that. And he's like, well, I can either burn it where it becomes stars or it's going to stay in the ground. It's going to be there forever. And because they don't really know um, enough about, you know, uh, trash and stars and fire and stuff like that, they can't really explain why he's wrong. And so kind of in another way, it's like, oh, you may come to this presentation and say, like, oh, contract-driven development, we should really start doing this, and, you know, a manager or someone above you may be like, wait, why do we need to change? What's wrong with, like, our current way of doing things? Um, this first part of this presentation is going to kind of go through some of that, some scenarios uh, that kind of maybe explain some of the problems and difficulties of not doing contract-driven developments. So this first one, and I love to use GIFs, so we're going to look at that, and is it... Can everybody kind of see that? Okay, good. Um, and it's going to kind of have an idea of trying to communicate with an already existing service that maybe doesn't have the best documentation. So we have our client, and they need to connect to the customer uh, service to get customer information. And it's like, okay, well, did you read the documentation? They have a Word doc. Okay, call get customers to get information. Well, they do that with the HTTP get, but it's actually a post endpoint. Oh, he's like, call get customers and not get anything back. Oh, four or five, you should have been using a post. Okay, so he's now calling with a post. Now, oh, still getting nothing back. Oh, did you send the header for authorization? Okay, now you're sending everything, authorization header. Oh, 500 error. What went wrong now? Well, now the service is down because it's being brought down from maintenance. Oh, it gets back a 200 uh, HTTP code, but it has an error. And it 
he doesn't even know what it means. You know, just error code one, two, three, no information about what it actually happens. So what's going on here? Well, we have a poorly defined or undocumented API. We have inconsistent behaviors and patterns. I mean, not necessarily you have to use rest for everything, but like it's uh, using verbs within the name instead of actually having that being the HTTP. So maybe it's doing it there, but in another area, maybe it's following proper rest for protocol. Uh, so you have potentially inconsistent behavior or patterns. And then also testing against a live service can lead to inconsistent results. There's been times I know where I was working and developing against some sort of new API, and then, like, I think I finally have it working, I'm calling it correctly, and I'm still getting failures, and so I'm, like, looking through, maybe, maybe something's wrong with my API, or something's, you know, set up incorrectly, and maybe after two days of working and trailing, um, uh, tracking people down on what's going on to get, like, that uh, person information on how it's actually working, I actually find out that maybe that the service that I was actually trying to call was misconfigured or something, or it was down, and so I just wasted two days, all because, like, the service was down, but... I think we all have kind of been here kind of judging by some of the laughs that we've tried working with APIs and it's just, you had no idea how it works just because you're using like a PDF or a Word document to actually use it and that API, the documentation is badly out of date because it's only updated and written once when it was first deployed and it's never updated since. So another problem um, without, with not doing uh, contract development is you have a very serial um, path to how you do production. So you're starting off like a new um, feature, a new service, or you may be adding a new feature to a service. And so you kind of had all your design meetings and now you're gonna actually get going, but now you kind of have to wait on the service developer to actually build and write that service so you, the client developer, can actually start writing and building against it. And so what are some of the problems with that? Well, okay, now, Service developer back there is saying, all right, freeze while I get it ready. Well, client's like, well, is the order imprint ready? Nope, had to make a change. Is the you know, API finalized? Nope, making a model change or something like that. And now this freeze and everything just got pulled into a production issue, and now that means all these features and stuff you want to be working on as a client well, can't be done until that service developer um, has now a chance again to continue doing their work. Again, what's going on here? There's an inability to develop in parallel. Not until usually the service is at some sort of advanced stage can you really begin writing. I mean, you could, you could kind of do it maybe a way of where you're saying like, hey, this is what the API is gonna look like and it's gonna look like these things, but you can run into those issues where there's just maybe slight variations on what it actually ends up looking like once the service developer actually writes it. I know, again, there's been times when Generally, I'm on more of the back end side of things where I'm like, oh yeah, it's gonna have, you know, it's a person object, it's gonna have first name, last name, middle name, and so on. And just how I actually name those fields is maybe slightly different from what the client is expecting. And then you, what you end up with is your, your timeline is gonna be impacted by delays from both the service and client developers. So obviously we see there that that service developer gets pulled into some sort of production issue and then that kind of delays when the client developers can continue working on it. But then uh, with the client developers, maybe they can finally start working on it, but then they get pulled into a production issue or they have something else come up. So you just, you have a lot of potential to delay, whereas if you have the ability to work in parallel, well then if one slides delayed, the other one can continue progress while the other one catches up or is working on it as well. And then also eventually the client developer maybe has to get up to speed. So you had all those design means on how you're gonna actually work with and implement the API but then it's like two weeks or two months or who knows how long before that API is ready for you to actually start programming against it. And all that information you had in your head when you were first going through those design meetings is just completely gone now just because you've had a thousand other things to do in the interim. So you had to take you know, a week or so to just kind of remember like, oh, okay, this is how I was gonna actually work with this API and this is how I was gonna call this endpoint and then build it into my system. And finally, we have the situation, okay, you're working with an API out there, but it's also continue, in continued development, and sometimes maybe something changes about it. So all of a sudden, a service developer is like, I'm gonna change this API get customers to customers to fall proper rest. But no one ever told the client, and it was deployed to production last night. And well, now you're gonna have to stay late, 
And oh wait, also, hey, the customer model is gonna be changed as well. So hey, have fun dealing with that. And why are they always, the client developer is the last person to hear about these changes. So again, what's happening here? Well, breaking API changes are not caught until they get to production. You know, uh, of course you can write integration tests, but you kind of run into those problems I was talking about in the first presentation, or the first scene, where by relying upon uh, live services, you have the issues where they could be down because of misconfiguration issues, um, or they could be misconfigured, or maybe the data that you're using to run your test, it got changed or something. So your test, you're not really believing in them when they fail because it could be failing for a lot of reasons that really have nothing to do with what you're actually testing for. You actually push it to production and it works just fine because the production services you know, are set up correctly and have all the data you're kind of expecting. So you just kind of start ignoring like, oh, that integration test failed, who cares? And eventually, after enough failures and when it doesn't actually mean anything, you just start ignoring it um, so you don't believe in it anymore. Also, the API change is heavily governed by the service developer. The service developer is just gonna make a change to how the API looks that maybe best suits what they feel like the API should look like. And so then the service developer, or the client developers that just have to kind of accept that, they don't really get a whole lot of say and how it should look. So hopefully that seems some relevant. That's kind of maybe, I think, three broad scenarios of kind of covering a lot of the problems with not doing contract-driven development. So let's start digging in to see how contract-driven development um, actually can start resolving these issues. And for this, we're going to be looking at Spring Cloud Contract. So why Spring Cloud Contract? Well, actually, for here, I don't really need to explain it. We're all Spring developers, so presumably interested in using Spring. All the same, it is a very actively developed project. Actually, a couple of the main developers on that project are in this presentation, so I'm definitely not nervous at all about that. Uh, it's also interoperable with other tools and standards, OpenAPI, Pact, uh, I believe Swagger, there's like a plugin or library for it as well. So if you're already using these tools, it's not like you have to like throw it all away and have to learn something new. You can kind of go ahead and start using that, your existing technology, and maybe migrate over, just kind of keep it how it is. All the same, that interoperability is really nice. It also has flexible documentation um, support with Spring REST docs. So you can write out these contracts, and from these contracts, you can actually create some very nice looking documentation for it as well. It's not you just have to look and understand these contracts. You can create something that's very human readable. And finally, and this is where, of course, the collaborative part comes in, it has polyglot support. And you can read more of it at this link. So initially, when Spring Cloud Contract was first uh, deployed or released, you were writing contracts with Groovy. And this is kind of what a very simple contract would look like. Imagining you're calling some sort of like person service, and you're adding a new one, and you're getting a 201 response back, and with a header, um, showing where that location should be. So Groovy, pretty simple example of that. And this is kind of gets back to the point of here's a request, here's what it looks like a post, here's this URI and kind of what the content's supposed to look like, and then here's what the response should look like given this kind of request. So you have this contract written, add new person, and then you can actually then run it against the service to see does the service given this actually responded this way and if it does great the test pass of course you're not going to have just no no meaningful api it's just going to have one contract one behavior with it you're going to have a bunch of different contracts all kind of explaining out how to use your service what happens when things go good what happens when things go bad and so on when all these tests pass part of your ci cd process um, they'll eventually be built and then bundled together into a stubs artifact. And then that stubs artifact can be put into your artifact repository so that it can be shared among your organization or whoever might be consuming your services. So you know you can put it into a third party location or a public location if you have some external vendors or external clients. And then finally, those clients then, instead of having to test against their live service, they can actually test against this Stubbs artifact, which is always going to give consistent results, and it's going to also be much faster. Uh, and so it's going to, you know, if the client developers are using the API correctly, then hopefully our other tests should pass. And of course, also then, you can actually 
um, take all these contexts, as mentioned, and then use it to create um, documentation that can also then be shared with clients of how to use your API. So, oh, that little colon's a little bit off, but the first part, the running in contacts, um, that's gonna define the behavior, and then the second, you're gonna validate it, third, you're gonna bundle them together as shareable artifacts, and then you're gonna test against it, and then you're gonna generate documents. And the, that second through fifth steps, these should be part of your automated process. So every time you're making a change and building your applications, these tests are being run, so that way, if something changes about the API, some step is, in this is gonna break, really probably the first step, or the second step, actually validating those API matches, and that's gonna prevent um, any sort of un, un, or unexpected changes to the API from reaching production, and it's also always gonna make sure that your APR, your documentation, is always up to date with whatever the API currently looks like. All right, but how are we gonna get into this collaborating, collaborative process? Uh, so service developers, client developers can actually really start working together. So right now you have like produce a different contract. If it's, you know, a lot of times the front end clients, they're gonna be probably JavaScript developers writing your UI, UX, and like a spa. And this is all kind of with Java. So really it's kind of maybe more producer driven contracts and the service is telling you what the API looks like. And for the client, this is still really great because they actually have some real nice um, contract they can actually program against that's also going to always get consistent results. But another way you can do this, perhaps with maybe a more collaborative approach, is consumer-driven contracts as well. And so the client can explain, hey, this is what I need from the service, and now the service developer is like, oh, okay, yeah, I can write this, and then they can test against this contract, and then eventually get something deployed out to production. Uh, but why is collaboration important? Well, it gives you better utilization of developer time. Whoever may have time right now to write these contracts, they can be the one writing it instead of all of it being on one side, you know, whether it's the service developer or the client developer. Uh, more input from all parties on the API design. So instead of just one having one opinion on what this API should look like, you can get both the consumers of this API and the producer of the API kind of working together on designing what it should look like. And hopefully this will leave more lead to more buy-in from all the parties on API design. Instead of it just being dictated to you, um, as a consumer, you can actually have a real say in how it all should look. However, we can't spell collaborative without polyglot. Well, okay, maybe I guess you can. All the same, though, it's not really going to mean anything unless you can actually allow um, JavaScript developers to use tools they're familiar with to write these contracts without having to learn a whole new stack. So what are some language-independent tools? Okay, well, Java developers, JavaScript developers, and other developers. You know, Java developers are obviously going to have a JDK installed on the system, so like they can build Groovy contracts and so on, but JavaScript developers, other developers, probably not. Maven or Gradle or whatever your build tool. Again, Java developers, probably. Um, other developers and JavaScript developers, no. Same with the Java-friendly IDE. Um, so yeah, you can see your problem here. But Docker, who here has Docker installed on their system? Yeah, almost everyone. Uh, so yes, you know, everyone's probably gonna have Docker, or at least it's language independent. And of course, everyone's, if they're a developer, they're gonna have a text editor of some sort, so that's really all you need. So recently, um, within like the last year or so, uh, Spring Cloud Contract has started to allow the ability to write contracts in YAML. YAML, you know, sometimes the fact that you have white space having meaning um, can be a little bit frustrating, but it's also something that's completely independent of any specific language platform. JavaScript developers can write this, Java developers can write this, .NET developers can write YAML. They can all write and understand YAML. You're not gonna have to have um, learning a whole new stack to start writing this stuff out. So that contract I written, wrote earlier, uh, or sold earlier in Groovy, this is what the equivalent contract would look like in YAML. So you can also see that it doesn't get any more, actually it's a little bit less contract, complex in many ways. Um, but it's not like you're taking some sort of like, oh, it's gonna be much more harder to write. It's used for more, more or less just as easy. And then we have some Docker images for reading and um, reading these contracts. So the, they encapsulate all the Java and Spring and logic within the Docker container. So again, all you need is Docker. 
and there's images for both the consumer side and the producer side, and they can be configured by passing in environment variables. And so kind of how it would work is if you're the client, um, you can just call this Docker uh, image that's going to be bringing in this Stubbs artifact that we kind of talked about earlier, and you can test to see if your client will actually work against that. And again, that can be just a good of a stand-in against the actual live service. Alternatively, you can also have the Docker image bring in these contracts and then test to make sure the service actually works against this. And again, this can all be done just through Docker. So if you're maybe a Node developer writing a Node JavaScript service, even you can kind of work on this. So you can work on it for both sites, either client or um, producer. All right, but let's actually see this behavior in action. Let's not actually talk about it. So this is live coding. So does anyone want to be the sacrifice if something doesn't start working? Any, no hands? Okay, I'll just choose a random then. All right, so I am a Java developer through and through. Um, so this is a Java backend, and I'm just going to be kind of using Postman to really interact with it. But you can also, but as far as how I'm going to be using Spring Cloud Contract, it's going to be entirely through um, uh, just uh, language independent tools, Docker and YAML. So anyways, I have this producer service that is serving up produce. And right now I just have a single Git mapping, um, so I won't have to spend so much time typing, I just have the other stuff currently commented out because really you're not here to see me write out a RESTful service. So Git mapping, and it's just gonna return a bunch of produce and so I had this contract here written in an YAML, just re description of retrieving all produce. And so it's going to make a Git call to API v1. And is this large enough for everyone to see, like even way in back? Good? Good. OK, great. So it's going to call this API, API v1. And given this, it should get a 200 response back. And it's going to kind of return four different items. And it should also then have a header type of application JSON. All right, so let's actually see this in action. Oh, sorry. And then, so then I have a couple of scripts, and these are then running the Docker images. So here's like the Docker image, Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud contract, and I'm using the most recent release. And just to kind of quickly go over, I'm saying to call the, um, application at this URL, which is actually my local machine. I'm going to publish the artifacts, and then I'm just going to give like the Maven coordinates as to what this artifact will look like. So producer service, this should match with the API service name, um, and then what group it's going to be in, where I can send those um, deploy to for like our shared artifact repository. Um, and then I'm telling it where to read the uh, contracts from, and then also the output from running the test. So here I have my contracts, and right now I have just my find all contracts. I obviously have some other contracts in here, but they're currently uh, different than the YAML, so they won't be picked up. And again, retrieving all pr produce. So let me get this uh, producer service started here. Fortunately, my scene's been deciding to run kind of slower lately, so take about 15 seconds to get it going. So yeah, just a normal Spring Boot application. One moment. Okay, just kick that out for now. All right, our application is up and running. So I'm going to take that existing um, get all produce service, and I'm going to tell it to be um, going to run a script to validate it. So now 
it's going to spin up a Docker image. It's going to read in that contract, and then it's going to call that service to make sure that its API actually matches what is expected. It behaves in a way that's expected based upon that contract. Again, why that runs. So if I call API v1 produce, I'm going to expect back a response that looks like this. And currently, right now, while that runs, so right now I can again also call this service and that's like the response I'm getting back. Okay, it's just about done. All right, so yes, all the tests passed as expected. So now, of course, I am building against this live service, uh, but I can run into issues. You know, again, this service could go down. Like I could just bring it down myself. Um, so we want to have something that is always going to give us the same result back. So you can, like I said, both run a Docker image to validate the contracts and validate the service is matching it. You can run also an um, an image uh, to actually then read in that artifact read in that stubs artifact that we're building that was built when we just ran that uh, docker build And so here, um, what we're telling to do, we're telling to go out and look in this artifact repository, which again, this is just an artifact repository, artifact repository running on my local machine. And it's going to say, look for this producer service stubs artifact that we just built with this version. And then we're going to run it on port 9876 uh, as the location to actually hit it for our stubs artifact. And that's just kind of here, just kind of setting up uh, Docker then to do that behavior. All right, so that's running. So before here, I was running on port 8080. But now, if I actually call the stubs port, I get the same result back, and I get that every time. So that's great. And so the problem can be sometimes is like this data, you could have it change. So if I was to restart this service, my uh, running service, and actually before we do that, because it's slow. So if I was to restart this service, um, and we call it again, instead of just giving four results back, we're going to get five results because we added some data to it, um, which would work. And, you know, generally maybe kind of in this example, maybe adding another um, line of data wouldn't be much of an issue. But we, again, we've all run into those problems where we have like maybe some automated tests running and like the existing test data has changed in some way, removed, values changed, and now those previous automated tests we had running are starting to fail because of that change in behavior or that change in data. So, yes, we call this... So we call this again, and yeah, now we're getting back five results, of course. Um, so that they can change in data that can just make it very difficult to write automated tests around. But if this was a fail, it's not failing because something actually changed in how the behavior works. We just added some more data. So we can continue adding some more contracts. So. So we're going to add another contract, uh, finding by specific name of produce. We'll stop the stubs service for now. We validate again, and it should work.
But actually, so right now, I also uncommented out that other get endpoint. But where if you write a contract for um, something that's not yet there, it should fail because that means the API doesn't actually do that behavior. So once this runs, we'll kick this off again. Oh, it failed. That's not good. So one thing is nice. Inevitably, failures will happen. That's just kind of the way programming goes. And there is a really nice um, way you can actually go and see the results of your test. Oh, okay, so it picked up the fact that I um, uncommented out that add produce. And the reason it failed is because that API, or we don't have a post um, endpoint available at that API. So it returns a 405 saying, hey, your API does not actually match the contracts you have available. So we uncomment this out again. <laughs> We execute, these should all pass. But as you start to build up an API, uh, you, you get this consistent behavior. Um, that you're, it's always going to match what you're expecting it to do. If you have um, contracts that are out there that the API doesn't yet implement, it's going to notice it and it's going to cause the test to fail. So that way, if you have it part of any of your um, pipeline process running these automated tests, you're not going to get, like in that third scenario, um, some sort of test out there that does not yet um, match that behavior. And of course. Oh, I didn't restart uh, my Spring Boot service. Let's run it one more time, should work. <coughs> so while that runs, um, we're going to kind of look just a little bit ahead on this. Um, so you also want to sign some flexibility perhaps in what your inputs are. And we're going to take a look at that here in just a moment. Uh, because sometimes the specific data doesn't necessarily matter so much as it kind of matches with a certain established pattern of what you're looking for. And we'll kind of see why that can be very helpful um, in just a moment. So OK, all those tests pass. And so now, if I was then to take in that new uh, Stubbs artifact that was just generated after all these tests run. Okay, that Stubbs service is already up. So if I call here 8080 with this post endpoint, everything passes, I get back a 200 back here. Now if I call 9876 with that, I get back a 404 not found, and the reason why it says the content type doesn't match exactly um, a application JSON charts at UFTA 8 with what I actually wrote in this contract. So here I wrote um, it has to be application. This is what the header should be. Um, because that didn't match, it failed. So we can actually add some flexibility to this. So I'm still going to write in the contract that this is what it should look like, but I can then write matchers here to say, well, as long as it starts with application JSON, that's all that really matters. Uh, similarly, you know, it doesn't, 
does it always have to be Kiwi that we send in? Well, no, not really. But as long as it is an alphanumeric value in there, okay, that is fine. Similar with quantity, it doesn't have to always be 75 because that's not actually how things work. Uh, we just need it to be um, at least one or more um, numbers that are put in there, and it has to be numeric. And similarly, uh, with the um, body of uh, the response, it doesn't always have to be this ID of 10 that's returned, just the ID has to be numeric in case we had some more um, values added in there. So if we were to, let me comment out this old one. And comment this one in. So then this, again, should pass without issue. And while that's passing, so in this case, so far I've always kind of shown, hey, I'm giving you some good examples of data, and then you give me back a 200 response. But Splink Cloud Contract isn't merely built around only handling when things go good. You need to also define what happens when some a client misuses your API. So here, uh, the field name is required, uh, but I forgot to put it. So in this example then, instead of sending back a 200 response, I'm supposed to send back a 400 error response. And then within the body, it's going to be then error message instead of what a normal body would look like for adding a new produce. And it's just going to say missing required value. Of course, this is extremely simplified, but it could be expanded upon to kind of handle whatever it might make sense then for your service. So let me go in here, comment this one. And so then, yeah, I just am now just calling down to a service instead of directly to the repo. And it's just then checking those fields to make sure they're all correct. And if they're not, it's going to then throw this uh, client exception, which is then caught by this exception handler. And in that case, it's going to return a bad request with the error message. And so from the previous example, um, also our tests still pass after updating the contract. And then let's add this last contract in for this. And then run it one more time. Oh, thank you. We got the app up start. Yeah, started up before it was testing it, so I think we might be still good. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, so everything passed. And now, like I said, I'm a Java developer through and through. I get kind of angry when I have to look at uh, JavaScript. So I know I'm using Postman, um, but you can also, of course, if this was like a JavaScript application, you could be using that to test against this as well. So we'll just run the mock producer service. And that is all running. And we're, again, once again, hitting against this Stubbs API. And if we send a response, oh yeah, there we go. And of course, also, if we were to take this out where, it's where there is no name, it's going to not send back a 200 response. That's not right. Yeah. Well, uh, not sure what went wrong there. It shouldn't have uh, done that. Let me see what happens against the real API. All right. Well, the real API is <laughs> working.
All right, I'll have to see what's wrong there. That should have returned a 400 response. Uh, I think there's an issue with uh, some of the matching and how it goes um, on. I'll get that fixed within my uh, application here. Anyways, though, with contract uh, defined services, let's kind of go back to these scenarios I talked about at the start of the presentation. Um, so you're not going to kind of run into these issues. Your API is going to be automatically documented as part of the process. The accurate documentation encourages this uh, discussion in, on design and consistency within your API. And um, also, your clients can develop and test against these contracts that give consistent results, so you can have more faith in your automated test. The serial development, now you can have clients and service developers, they can work in parallel once the contract is written. You're not having to wait for our whole service to be built out. Um, this process, again, encourages discussion on the API design, since you kind of have it all just talked about in real time as you're building it out. Altering the API. Um, the API is going to be checked now as every time as part of the build process, so if someone makes a change to how the API looks, it's going to fail. As we kind of saw during my demo, if I have a contract and the API doesn't actually match what that contract is doing, that test is then going to fail. Um, as kind of said, where are the costs either the client or service to fail? So also, like let's say the contract and so on has been updated, um, then the client hasn't been updated to consume it, the client's test will fail when it's trying to um, test against that the stubs artifact. And so this prevents rogue changes from gain production where they can maybe sometimes become finalized because usually it's easier to roll forward than it is to roll back. Uh, so a change that maybe no one really wanted is all of a sudden now the way things will look in production going forward. Um, just a few final points. So in this example, all I showed was REST and HTTP, but you can also use Spring Cloud Contract for writing, um, for doing messaging, Kafka message, or not just Kafka, but any kind of messaging. Um, it's flexible enough to do that. It's also, we hear contracts, and so we think you can't change it, like that's breaking the contract, but it's, of course, always okay to change the contracts as the API changes and updates through time. Uh, contract tests are, should not be considered acceptance tests, nor do they replace the sort of end-to-end -end test. They're just part of your test suite. You're not going to be able to test things like resiliency, timeout, performance, edge cases, and so on. You still need these other uh, kinds of tests, but you're going to be able to kind of make those integration tests a whole lot easier and a whole lot quicker to run. Anyways, stick around for some Q&A. And um, the code I showed here, um, it's not quite out there, but it, when it is, when I push it, after I clean it up a little bit, it's going to be at that URL. And there's some great documentation, of course, where I just kind of basically take all the information and write it. And a lot of this presentation is actually based upon this blog article from um, early last year. And once again, you can find me at Billy Crando on Twitter and email me at William Crando at IBM. And happy to answer uh, any questions. Yes. If these contracts would live in a um, single repository or in, in every repository for a service or a client, and how it would be organized in the CI/CD pipeline. So yeah, you could put them in like a separate repository where you can pull them down to read from, um, or you could like have them be stored like on the service. Like it's there's a different options um, to read from. But yeah, you would then include this as part of your, like your CID, CICD process. That's something I'm planning on continuing adding onto this presentation to kind of show how you would really incorporate this into like a CID, CICD pipeline. So, any other questions? Uh, how do you, when you're defining a contract, how do you define the uh, setup for a test? So for example, uh, in this uh, contract, uh, the server must have returned four, four objects. Yeah. And uh, how do you define the you know actions uh, that are needed to be done, like inserts to a database, or some endpoints uh, hit it before the test? So yeah. So that server returns these four objects. Yes. So in this example, I was hitting against a live service. Now, in a more realistic example, you would have all that underlying behavior mocked out so like you know exactly what's going to get initially returned. So as you're actually initially writing out those contracts, they're going to pass. Um, so how you would uh, do that um, in the real world, uh, 
is you just have underlying mocked out behavior when you're actually calling out that um, that those tests. So, yes, sir. <laughs> So talking about, about the real world again, uh, uh -huh. do you keep a versioning of the same contract or do you replace the same contract uh, again and again? Because sometimes you want to keep two versions running in parallel of the same uh, endpoint of the API in production. So how you would really probably want to do that is kind of like this within the URL of your API, you would have like a V1 or V2 or, and so on. So that's how, how you would actually handle that kind of versioning. So. so you will have two different files. Yeah, you would then have to have a separate contract written out uh, because this contract uh, is still pointing to V1. So maybe you would then update this contract to maybe be V1, or you would probably always have it be V1 when you're written it out. And you would still want this contract obviously out there and being tested against so long as that API is still alive and public because you're still obviously supporting it at that time. And again, you know, also if you have a question later on, um, free for you to send me a question. Also, we have some of the experts far more uh, knowledgeable in free cloud contracting here as well. So, it'll be fine. Right. Thank you. Thank you.